Welcome again to Cisco Live Barcelona. In this master series, we're going to provide uh, introduction to IoT specifically geared to network engineers. My name is Tim Segetti. I'm a principal engineer in the technical marketing group for the IoT business unit of Cisco. And let's get rolling. So what is IoT? Well, it's big, it's broad, it covers a lot of things. So sometimes people have a difficulty grasping the essence of it. And so the analogy I like to use is comparing digital technologies to the human body. If we do that, then naturally compute resources would compare to what? Well, probably you'd think that compute resources would be most analogous to our human brain. That's where we do all our we gather our memories, we do all our processing, we do our learning, all of this is done in our brain. However, our brain is very abstract and it needs a conduit to interact with the physical world. And how does it do this? It's through our nervous system. And effectively, that's what IoT is all about. Connecting digital compute resources, the brains of digital technologies, with the physical world. So the way we connect is that we have sensors, we have eyes that you know, sense light, ears that sense sound, you know, fingers that can sense you know, temperature, touch, texture, a whole bunch of things. We have all those senses. But not only can we sense, take in input from the physical world, but we can actually change and affect change in the physical world by actuating our bodies, again, via the conduit of our nervous system. So as a very simple, Overall analogy, that's what IoT is all about, connecting the digital world with the physical. And as such, we see tremendous amount of digital transformation in all industries being driven by this type of IoT-enabled digital transformation projects. In mining, we have autonomous vehicles to make the mining operations safer. And not only safer, but they can even autonomous um, robots can make mines even more productive because then they can go and extract resources in areas that it wouldn't be safe to send in workers to. And so productivity gains as well as safety gains, so forth. We have, for instance, uh, medical supplies in Africa being delivered by drones that are controlled via IoT technologies. And that again, makes people safer, gets them the medicine they need. We see uh, advances in agriculture and farming, oil and gas, manufacturing, virtually every industry is adopting the value that IoT presents in its digital transformation. And why is that? Well, it's very simple, because all of these different sensors can generate data. And if you have data, every decision you make based on data becomes a better decision. You can increase your safety, improve your productivity, reduce your, I mean, improve your efficiency, reduce your waste, so on and so forth. Okay, given that landscape, from a networking engineer's perspective, what are the three main challenges? It's not to say that these are the three only challenges, just because we have a fixed amount of time today, let's focus on the three main challenges of IoT when it comes to networking. What do you think the first challenge is? Well, if you're thinking security, you're absolutely right. That is by far the first and foremost challenge. Two out of every three customers say, you know what? What's holding us up or what we're most concerned about in our IoT project is security. And that stands to reason because when you start connecting all these devices, you are massively expanding your threat surface and all the vectors that you're open to attack. And all these devices that are being added to your network, very few of them have any levels of security built into them whatsoever. They don't have digital certificates. There aren't users logging on and authenticating through these devices. They're just coming on the network. They have very lightweight capabilities, little or no security designed in them. It's a, it's a top of mind concern for every network engineer and architect designing a solution for IoT. What's the second main solution? Uh, challenge? Well, scalability. Regardless of what analysts you listen to, the projections are all astronomical as to how many devices are coming online. Here at Cisco, of a company of 70,000, we already manage more than 500,000 devices today. Just one company, half a million devices. So you can see how as this scales, and over time, there'll be even more devices come on online, scalability 
to address all the needs to manage all these devices, that's another overwhelming challenge. The third main challenge is simplicity. If I have to have one set of systems or platforms to manage these devices and others for those and these for, it becomes overwhelming. And our IT departments are not scaling with people at the same level, if at all, like we're scaling the number of devices coming on to our network. So we have to do more with less and we have to keep it simple as possible. So three main challenges again, security, scalability, and simplicity. There are other ones as well, like meeting the environmental needs. You know, these devices sometimes are living in very harsh environments from a temperature extremes point of view, from electromagnetic radiation point of view, from if it's on any type of transport vehicle, from a shock and vibration. All of those have to be taken into account, but these are the three key ones. So let's focus on that this morning. How is Cisco meeting these challenges? Let's talk about some of them. So let's start with the networking platforms themselves. When we take our networking platforms, such as this Catalyst Industrial Ethernet 3400 switch, we're basically ruggedizing platforms that our customers are already familiar with. This is effectively the same Catalyst switch as you have in your wiring closet. It's running iOS XE, just like your Catalyst 9K switches are running. So it has all the same programmable interfaces, got the same capabilities, supports the same features, and most of all, can be managed by the same platforms. Except it's built completely re-engineered from the inside out to withstand the rugged environments that they're exposed to. Similarly, on the routing side, This is a ruggedized ISR router. It does everything your regular ISR router does. However, you can see the form factor is quite small. This is actually a router plus an expansion module, so it can have dual slots, redundancy. I might have you know, um, dual connections, maybe one to one carrier, one to another, and I can run SD-WAN solutions on it just like I would any other ISR router because it's got all the same capabilities, same programmable interfaces, tremendous amount of flexibility. I can hot swap modules, pulling them in and out. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. I can hot swap my modules, pulling them in and out so I can go from 3G to 4G to 5G when it's available in my area and then I have myself all this uh, flexible future proofing. So starting with this type of hardware is fundamental. It meets the needs of environment and and low power, this actually takes less power, one-tenth the power of a regular incandescent light bulb. So 10 watts of power, extremely low draw. So that's very valuable in remote locations too, where you might not have power available, you got to rely on solar cells. Okay, so starting with these platforms then, they all have compute capabilities as well. Where do we go from there? Well. We secure the device, first of all, at every single level, at the mechanical hardware level. We have anti-counterfeiting chipsets that prevent even software to be tampered with. Um, also, we secure all the communications using encryption like MACSEC or IPSEC, depending on the platform and the, and the use cases. We secure all the applications, so there's security at every layer, not just within the platform, but as we're going to talk about soon, we have a new security product called Cisco CyberVision that we'll talk about and demonstrate that secures the entire industrial control system. Now, how about simplicity? What are we doing in this area? Well, you've probably heard about intent-based networking. What is intent-based networking at a high level? Well, when you're giving instructions, whether it's programming a computer or even interacting with a taxi cab driver, there's two ways that you can provide instructions. One is called the imperative model. The imperative model is where you break down every last detail of your instructions to multiple discrete steps and you provide all of that detail. You say, okay, if you're dealing with a cab driver, take me to the airport. You don't tell them that. You say, go on this street for 100 meters, turn left, go 200 meters, turn right, and then you break it down like that. That's called the imperative model. That's very complicated. Requires a lot of detail. However, to simplify that, you can use what's called the declarative model. You just express your intent. What is the result 
that you want to have happen at a given time, and then you leave it to the intelligent agent, in this case the taxi cab driver, to deliver that intent however they see fit. So that's what intent-based networking is about. We've embedded a lot of intelligence in our network controllers that can deliver the intent that you express and therefore you don't have to provide all those details. Not only this, but we're the only company that can provide intent end-to-end, -end, all the way from the applications in your data center, through your enterprise network, all the way to your IoT edge. That's huge, that's an architectural game changer, this multi-domain story that we offer to our customers. And then, once we've solicited your intent, we don't require you to go box by box and program it, our controllers will take care of that via automation. So here's how you meet the scalability challenge. You comprehensively and consistently, without error, push out all the policy that you've expressed across your entire network very simply, very efficiently. This is how you meet scale, scaling requirements. So you don't need 100 people to configure all your network devices line by line using text editors and so on and so forth. Okay, so now let me shift a little bit of focus to a new technology that we just announced a couple days ago here at Cisco Live Barcelona in the keynote speech with uh, David Geckler's keynote speech, our, our SVP Liz Santoni, uh, shared the details of what we're, the huge steps forward we've made in the operational technology uh, area of IoT, and this is Cisco CyberVision. This is a result of a recent acquisition we did last year of a company called Centrio based in Lyon, France. So what is this all about? Well, in these IoT environments, particularly industrial IoT environments, it's heavily focusing on what is called operational technology. That is, the sensors we talked about and the actuators that cause physical change. Whether that physical change is to build a car or some other product, to pump oil or to deliver utilities like power or transport services, whatever that is. These are all the same overall type of technologies. And they're technologies that we may not be familiar with in an in, um, IT environment. We have all the things themselves. And each of these types of things, these sensors or robots or actuators, are controlled by little computer systems nearby. And these types of computers are not typically, like I say, in an IT environment, but are industrialized, specialized. They use different protocols, different types of uh, interactions and communication patterns. Programmable logic controllers are one of the most popular. And basically, that will control the thing. Tell it what to, you know, give me your inputs and I will tell you what to do as your output, as the output from the PLC to the device. Then groups of these are then supervised by various uh, SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. And then these then are all integrated with the broader enterprise network using a model, an industry tip, traditional industry model called the Purdue model. And you can see there's a lots of hierarchy, lots of separation. You want, you want a complete demilitarized zone, not only between the company and the internet, but even between the IT part of the company and the production OT level of the company. There's a lot of separational requirements there in order to keep security. Not only separation, but even then these groups, these production lines can be grouped into cells so that they can restrict communication within them. And this is an industry best practice as well. So you can really see the need for segmentation and this kind of enforcement of how the communication is to happen. Now that's the theory. In practice, in the most part, it's not quite this way. And this type of uh, this, this reality has actually been exploited in the recent decade in various forms of OT attacks. So OT attacks like, are different from IT attacks. IT cyber attacks typically deal with breaches and exfiltration of data, more recently with also holding data for ransom. Those are the main styles of IT-oriented cyber attacks. OT attacks 
leverage that unique conduit between the digital world and the physical world to actually disrupt operations somehow, to cause something to fail physically. So the first of such attacks was a nation state attack against the Iranian nuclear program. And what had happened there is that the Iranian nuclear program, the devices that are controlling these large centrifuges that are vital to producing what is required to run it, um, they're controlled by programmable logic controllers and it was completely air gap. There's no external connection to these systems. However, a nation state or possible multiple nation states contrived and used some four day zero vulnerabilities to spread some malware on one of the five vendors that had access to these systems on one of their computers as they were brought in to do maybe some tests and maintenance or upgrades, that malware then was spread from within. And it looked for specifically Siemens programmable logic controllers, and it issued them a new command. And the logic controller is allowed to command the thing that it's controlling, in this case the centrifuge, and the thing will never question what it's being told to do. And it basically just said, spin faster. Let's say it was 30 RPM originally, then it would say spin at 75. So just a slight difference, a variable difference, and now these centrifuges spun so fast that they literally tore themselves apart. One in five was damaged by the end of this attack. So a digital attack with very real world physical consequences. A few years later, we saw another nation state attack. This time it was the first successful attack against a utility company. They took control of the utility systems. And there's even videos of you see people in the control room and they have no control and they're like, what is this person doing? They could see them uh, moving around and changing things and turning on and they shut down power for over 200,000 people for up to six hours. So a very real world consequence. Then we started to see a shift that these attacks were targeting now private industries, not Petya. It's, it seemed like ransomware at first, but it was not. <laughs> it was deliberately masquerading as such to, to distract attention to its real purposes, which was to attack these industrial control systems. Companies suffered huge, lo huge losses. For instance, one company, Merck, a pharmaceutical in the United States, they estimate their, their latest estimates of their losses during this two month period of interrupted operations to be $1.3 billion. About less than a year ago, the world's largest aluminum supplier, Norse Cardro, they were hit again with malware that was deliberately targeting their production, their operations. That's where, if you want to hurt a company, you target their operations. That's their bread and butter, that's where they make their money. And this type of attack took them down for two weeks and it cost them $75 million. And incidentally, North Hydro is really to be commended. They recently won a PR award for crisis communication. They were extraordinarily transparent in what was happening as it was happening, and therefore it benefited the industry at large so that they could implement measures to protect themselves uh, by learning the lessons that North Hydro was unfortunately experiencing. So kudos to them for that. Less than a month ago, a US port was shut down because again, another type of ransomware attack that came in through IT and it found its way to the OT networks and it started shutting down the things that load freighters onto boats. It even shut down the uh, video surveillance systems and a number of operational systems. So we see these becoming more and more prevalent. In fact, uh, recent uh, analysts have been saying that 40% of attacks are now OT targeted. Again, if you really, really want to hit a company hard and make them hurt, that's how you do it. Okay, so that's the environment. That's what's been going on. So how do you protect yourself in this environment? Well, first, recognizing that these two different environments have very different requirements when it comes to security. IT attacks, we can recognize worms and viruses. They have very specific signatures. In OT, for example, we have commands that are very legitimate and coming from a trusted source to a trusted destination. And in the case of Stuxnet, like I mentioned, the only thing that was suspicious and mal malware was the variable that says how fast to spin. In my 
hypothetical example going from 30 to 75. That was the attack. Otherwise, it looked like a completely legitimate instruction from a completely legitimate source to a completely legitimate destination. How do you protect yourself against that kind? Even if you have a security policy in place, you are saying this PLC is definitely allowed to talk to that thing and issue it instructions, but how do you know when that instruction is the wrong one? Other challenges is that a lot of devices in these environments are very old, and therefore they haven't been keeping up to date in their firmware to protect themselves. And this is a concept that OT environments, it's relatively new, and there's a lot of resistance to software upgrades and security hygiene. So how do you address that? Well, this is where Cisco CyberVision plays. It delivers device identification, operational insights, and anomaly detection. Device identification is pretty straightforward. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, as is anomaly detection. But what do we mean by this term operational insights? Well, basically it's giving these OT uh, people the information of what's actually happening on their network. Because a lot of them, they think, okay, well, as long as I have a firewall in place, or as long as I'm air-gapped, I'm safe. Or remember, we talked about Stuxnet. That was an environment that was completely air-gapped, and it was still subject to this huge attack. What we see in these environments is that there's this false sense of security, thinking that I've taken the necessary precautions, but when we start diving into the details, we see a lot of red flags and a lot of vulnerabilities. Let me share one specific example. And this was in a German auto manufacturer where we did an early field trial of CyberVision. In their factory, we noticed um, that there was a PLC that had recently received a whole new program. And then we brought this to the supervisor's attention. Hey, here's something that we noticed. Were you aware of this? And he's like, no, no, that's a bug in your system. That's impossible. We don't upgrade those only at certain periodic uh, intervals and only when there's, you know, it's signed off by several levels of hierarchy and blessed, and only then if these things ever upgraded or changed. It's a bug in your product. But then there was a little bit of curiosity. It's like, well, who or where do you, where do you allege that that instructions, those new instructions came from? We said, well, it actually came from an IP address in a local service provider outside of your organization. And the response was, oh, again, we're telling you, you're completely wrong, your, your software is buggy because there's no possible way that can happen. We have a firewall in place, that communication is not even possible. So again, that thinking of what is you know, the security posture versus the reality. As we invest, jointly investigated into this further, what had happened? There was a production line manager that wanted to improve the performance on his line. So after hours, when his line was down at home, he decides, I'm going to make a slight change to the way that my line operates. And in order for me to upload that new program, I got to get through that firewall. So he gets on the phone to his buddy in IT, who punches a temporary hole in the firewall, allowing for that communication to come in, allowing for that change to be done, and then it was cleaned up. The point is, all of this was done without the supervisor knowledge at all. And this was, a, this was not a malicious intent. This was a very you know, legitimate intent. He wanted to do something good, but the method that he went through to do it obviously it isn't the optimal one and it wasn't well tracked and reported and it was completely oblivious to the people that are ultimately in charge. And so to have a tool that can report to these types of supervisors in OT of these kind of events is tremendously valuable. Now we also talked about device identification. In OT environments you have all these devices and from an IT's perspective you don't know what they are. They are just MAC addresses, and IP addresses, and there's communication between them. Do you, is this legitimate? Is this nefarious? You have no idea, because you don't have the visibility. You don't know what those devices are, so how can you address policy? Or sometimes they talk not only to themselves, but there's communication flows to, say, the industrial data center, or the enterprise data center, or maybe even to a cloud provider, like a vendor that's running diagnostics. Are these, again, legitimate flows, or is this some sort of command and control that's happening? 
Again, if you don't know what the devices are, you can't implement policy. That's a challenge. Device identification is a challenge. How can we meet that challenge? Well, we're going to look at a demonstration now of Cisco CyberVision in action. And the use case that we're outlining is a baggage handling use case. A lot of you, perhaps to attend the Cisco Live, had to travel by air. So baggage and conveyor systems, uh, probably very familiar to you. Now, what most people don't recognize sometimes is how these are connected in uh, networks. In these environments, typically the, the networks are just flat layer two network. No security, no segmentation, completely vulnerable to broadcasts and multicast storms, and they can bring down these entire systems. I live in Vancouver, and our airport went down, and they had to divert traffic because the baggage systems went down because of a broadcast storm introduced by a layer two loop. Can you imagine that? That's how critical baggage systems are to an, April, uh, an airport. They're the second most critical function, second only to air traffic control. Because if you can't handle the bag, then the airport just gets crushed and falls over under its own weight. So that's how vital these operations are to the functioning of, say, an airport. Now, even if these systems are completely air-gapped and kept separate from the outside world, very commonly, technicians will come in to do maintenance, diagnostics, upgrade firmware, and they'll connect their own laptops, and if that laptop has malware on it, the malware will spread laterally end to end. There's nothing to stop that from happening at all. This is a very, very common occurrence. This is what, in the use case of Stuxnet, uh, happen, and it happens very regularly. So, let's take an example. I have a little setup over here that's simulating an, um, an airport conveyor system. And basically, even though it's miniaturized, even though it's simplified, all the functional components in this demo are very compatible with the real life full scale events. We have basically sensors and actuators controlled by programmable logic controllers, and then all of the traffic that's going through these are monitored by our Cisco devices, where CyberVision has an agent running in the, in the software of the network devices. And so that's an important point to recognize, first of all, is that CyberVision agent is running in the network devices themselves. We don't have to drop in additional sensors in the network. It passively listens to the uh, traffic that's in the network so that it doesn't interfere with the production traffic in any way, but it looks for all these communication patterns, not only what is being said, I'm sorry, not only who is talking to who, but what is being said, even at that variable level. So let's take a look at the output by what CyberVision is seeing in this example here. So if I log in to uh, Cisco CyberVision, then in my example here for my baggage control system, it's a tool that is very much oriented to OT and IT environments, and so I can see all my components, and I can see the communication patterns. I can view these in a number of ways. If I'm an OT person, I might want to see all my systems in a Purdue model, as we demonstrated, because that's familiar to them. And incidentally, you can see that any given system here that has a vulnerability is called out with a nice big red dot as to, okay, what systems have some sort of software or firmware vulnerabilities, and by clicking on these, we can introduce OT to um, security hygiene. So here we know every single device. Why? Because our CyberVision sensor speaks the language of these industrial protocols. It knows what they are because they're announcing it in their communication. We know the make, model, serial number, and firmware of any given device, and so we can locate these as needed if we have to do, say, a firmware upgrade. For example, I've clicked on this Rockwell controller, and now here's the list of the security vulnerabilities that are known for this type of Rockwell controller, this firmware version, and therefore we can um, put into, implement a plan to address these vulnerabilities to raise the security posture of my OT environment. It's very simple and easy to interface to understand. 
Not only this, though, for anomaly detection and operational insights, we talked about those as well. What I can do is I can baseline my network that says, OK, if I take a look at my network, I can see how things are communicating. I can see which traffic is control traffic or network traffic, where the communication patterns are going to and from, as well as what's being said, the variables, the details of the operation. And then I can compare. I can say, you know, from one point in time to another point in time, have there been any differences? I can see things, new devices that have appeared. They're shown here. Uh, in, there's three new components. What are they? I just click on them and it's highlighted for me what are the new components. What are the new activities, the new communication paths that I didn't see before and even to the variable level. Coming again back to our Stuxnet example. All that changed there wasn't that there was a new component on the network. It wasn't even a new communication flow. The PLC was talking to the centrifuge controller. All that was new was a new variable, spin faster. And we can even detect these as well and provide that operational insight and anomaly detection. So now, when we return to our diagram, we have a much better view of our entire network because we can see all these things and affect our security policy by sen the sensors that are in the network devices monitoring all of these, we can understand what the devices are, and we can share that information. This is very much a multi-domain solution. We take that information, share it with Cisco DNA Center, we can very quickly deploy segmentation policies, which we're just about to do. We can even share this information with our security products, like uh, StealthWatch, and enhance that visibility by providing the source device details, or with Talos, or with Firepower Management Center, and so forth. But let's continue the story to implement a policy and show how this is now even far more effective and easier to do. So for example, we have new capabilities just launched again this week in Cisco Software Defined Access Secure Policy Extended Node. And what is this about? I'm going to explain. It's all about segmentation. The ability to segment your network from these virtual networks, which is traditionally very hard to do. You've got to deploy VLANs, you've got to deploy addresses, program these into DHCP scopes, a plan for redundancy in your gateways as an exit from these VLANs to the rest of your network, develop, deploy your routing policies, and ultimately your, your access policies. You have to touch a lot of different management systems to do this, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of planning, a lot of effort, and ultimately, it ends up with a lot of complexity on your networking hardware, especially in forms of access lists. There's a better way to do this. We'll demonstrate that now. So if I log into Cisco DNA Center, if I want to create a virtual network for my IoT devices, I just click the plus button here, give my virtual network a name, and say, okay, what devices do I want in this virtual network? I might want badge readers, HVAC systems would be another good one as an example of IoT devices, and let's see, security cameras. And now, as soon as I do that and click Save, I'm done. That's all it's taken me to implement what is called macro segmentation, these large policies that isolate these devices end to end across my network and make sure that from their point of view, all they see is an IoT network. They can't even see, let alone talk to, the rest of the network. This is macro segmentation. This is what I've just deployed with a very few clicks. Very easy. But I can actually go further. And this is where the value of the new functionality in iOS 17.1.1, Secure Policy Extended Node, and it's available on our IE switches now as well. And so this allows me to do micro-segmentation. What does that mean? If we zoom in on the given IoT VLAN that we created, we put in cameras, we put in HVAC devices, and we put in badge readers. Should a video surveillance camera ever be talking to a badge reader or vice versa? No, they really have no business talking to each other. But within a virtual network, 
you can have any-to-any -any communication. However, the only time when one of these devices would try to talk to a device of a different type would likely be when they've been compromised and part of an IoT attack, and now they are scanning to see whoever, who else can they reach and communicate with so that they can propagate the malware. So if we want to lock down that type of communication so that cameras only can communicate with cameras or their controllers. Similarly, badge readers lock down that to that type of device or HVAC systems. They, even though they're in the same network, it's as if they're completely isolated from these other devices. How complex is that to do? Let's return to DNA Center, and then we create a group-based access policies that leverage security scalable group tags. And again, to implement, add such a policy is very easy. All we got to do is give the policy a name, and then we say, okay, let's say it's badge readers. It's going to be the source and HVAC systems, the destination. What is the specific of the policy that we want that will govern the communication? We'll say we're going to deny the communication between these two. And optionally, very quickly, we can say, you know what, do that in both directions. So that badge readers can't talk to HVAC systems, nor can HVAC systems talk to badge readers. And it becomes that simple. I click save, and it's pushed out. That's intent-based networking. I didn't have to do complex operations. I got all the information from Cisco CyberVision for identifying these things, sent them to, via PX Grid to ICE, who ICE in turn shares them with DNA Center. DNA Center then goes down and programs the device. So a lot going on, but that complexity is abstracted from the uh, end user operator. It becomes just intent-based networking, very scalable, very simple, very secure. Okay, so today we talked about how IoT is changing the world, especially in industry. From an IT engineer and network engineer's point of view, the three greatest challenges by far are security, scalability, and simplicity. And we covered what these challenges are as well as what Cisco is offering in each of these spaces to address them. We talked about security. It's at every layer in our devices, in the hardware, in the software, in the communications, at the application level, and even at the system level. We talked about Cisco CyberVision, new technology specifically designed for the OT space. For scalability, we showed the value of automation. And then simplicity, we showed intent-based networking, leveraging that basic policy. These can talk to those and nothing else. And we express that very naturally with just a few clicks and we've then deployed that comprehensively through our entire network. So we hope you enjoyed that introduction to IoT from a network engineer's perspective. Thank you for the, taking the time to join us this morning.